All Creatures Great and Small, Chapter 1. They didn't say anything about this in the books, I thought, as the snow blew in through the gaping doorway and settled on my naked back. I lay face down on the cobbled floor in a pool of nameless muck, my arms deep inside the straining cow, my feet scrabbling for a toehold between the stones. I was stripped to the waist and the snow mingled with the dirt and the dried blood on my body. I could see nothing outside the circle of flickering light thrown by the smoky oil lamp which the farmer held over me. No, nope, there wasn't a word in the books about searching for your ropes and instruments in the shadows, about trying to keep clean in a half bucket of tepid water, about the cobbles digging into your chest, nor about the slow numbing of the arms and the creeping paralysis of muscles as the fingers tried to work against the cow's powerful, expulsive efforts. There was no mention anywhere of the gradual exhaustion, the feeling of futility, and the little far-off voice of panic. My mind went back to that picture in the obstetrics book, a cow standing in the middle of a gleaming floor while a sleek veterinary surgeon in a spotless parturition overall inserted his arm to a polite distance. He was relaxed and smiling. The farmer and his helpers were smiling. Even the cow was smiling. There was no dirt or blood or sweat anywhere. The man in the picture had just finished an excellent lunch and had moved next door to do a bit of calving just for the sheer pleasure of it, as, of a, as a kind of dessert. He hadn't crawled shivering from his bed at two o'clock in the morning and bumped over twelve miles of frozen snow, staring sleepily ahead until the lonely farm showed in the headlights. He hadn't climbed half a mile of the white fell side to the doorless barn where his, pa where his patient lay. I tried to wiggle my way an extra inch inside the cow. The calf's head was back, and I was painfully pushing a thin, looped rope towards its lower jaw with my fingertips. All the time, my arm was being squeezed between the calf and the bony pelvis. With every straining effort from the cow, the pressure became almost unbearable, and then she would relax, and I would push the rope another inch. I wondered how long I would be able to keep this up. If I didn't snare that jaw soon, I would never get the calf away. I groaned. I set my teeth and reached forward again. Another little flurry of snow blew in and I could almost hear the flakes sizzling on my sweating back. There was sweat on my forehead too and it trickled into my eyes as I pushed. There is always a time at a bad calving when you wonder if you will ever win the battle. I had reached this stage. Little speeches began to flit through my brain. Well, perhaps it would be better to slaughter this cow. Her pelvis is so small and narrow that I just can't see a calf coming through. Or, she's a good fat animal and really of the beef type. So, don't you think it would pay better if you get her to the butcher? Or perhaps, this is a very bad presentation. In a rooming cow, it would be simple enough to bring the head around, but in this case, it's just about impossible. Of course, I could have delivered the calf by embryotomy, by passing a wire over the neck and sawing off the head. So many of these occasions ended with the floor strewn with heads and legs and heaps of intestines. There were thick textbooks devoted to the countless ways you could cut up a calf. But none of it was any good here, because this calf was alive. At my furthest stretch, I got my finger as far as the commissure of the mouth and had been startled by a twitch of a little creature's tongue. It was unexpected, because calves in this position are usually dead, asphyxiated by the acute flexion of the neck and the pressure of the dam's powerful contractions. But this one had a little spark of life in it. And if it came out, it would have to be in one piece. I went over to my bucket of water, cold now and bloody, and silently soaped my arms. And then I lay down again, feeling the cobbles, 
harder than ever against my chest. I worked my toes between the stones, shook the sweat from my eyes, and for the hundredth time thrust an arm that felt like spaghetti into the cow. Alongside the little dry legs of the calf, like sandpaper tearing against my flesh. Then to the bend in the neck, and so to the ear, and then, agonizingly, along the side of the face, toward the lower jaw, which had become my major goal in life. It was incredible that I had been doing this for nearly two hours, fighting as my strength ebbed to the push a little noose around that jaw. I had tried everything else, repelling a leg, gentle traction with a blunt hook in the eye socket, but I was back to the noose. It had been a miserable session all through. The farmer, Mr. Dinsdale, was a long, sad, silent man of a few words who always seemed to be expecting the worst to happen. He had a long, sad, silent son with him, and the two of them had watched my efforts with deepening gloom. Worst of all had been Uncle. When I first entered the hillside barn, I'd been surprised to see a little bright-eyed old man in a pork pie hat settling down comfortably on a bale of straw. It, he was filling his pipe and clearly looking forward to the entertainment. Now then, young man, he cried in a nasal twang of the re West Riding, I'm Mr. Dinsdale's brother. I farm over in Listendale. I put down my equipment and nodded. How do you do? My name is Harriet. The old man looked me over piercingly. My vet is Mr. Broomfield. Expect you'll have heard of him. Everybody knows him, I reckon. Wonderful man, Mr. Broomfield, especially at Cavan. Do you know? I've never seen him beat yet. I managed a wan smile. Any other time, I would have been delighted to hear how good my colleague was, but somehow, not now. Not now. In fact, the words set off a mournful little bell tolling inside me. No, I'm afraid I don't know, Mr. Brooms Broomfield. I said, taking off my jacket and, more reluctantly, peeling my sh sh shirt over my head. But I haven't been around these parts very long. Uncle was aghast. You don't know him? Well, you're the only one who doesn't. They think the world of him in Listendale, I can tell you that. He lapsed into a shocked silence and applied a match to his pipe. And then he shot a glint glance at my goose pimpled torso. Strips like a boxer does Mr. Broomfield. Never seen such muscles in a man. A wave of weakness coursed sluggishly over me. I felt suddenly leaden-footed and inadequate. As I began to lay out my ropes and instruments on a clean towel, the old man spoke again. And how long have you been qualified, may I ask? Oh, about seven months. <coughs> Seven months. Uncle smiled indulgently, tamped down his tobacco, and blew out a dark cloud of rank blue smoke. Well, there's not like a little bit of experience, I always say. Mr. Broomfield's been doing my work now for over ten years, and he really knows what he's about. No, nope. you can have your book learning. Give me experience every time. I tipped some antiseptic into the bucket and lathered my arms carefully. I knelt behind the cow. Mr. Broomfield always put something special lubricating oils on his arms first, Uncle said, pulling contentedly on his pipe. He says you get infection of the womb if you just use soap and water. Made my first exploration. It was the burden moment all vets go through when they first put their hand into a cow. Within seconds, I would know whether I would be putting on my jacket in 15 minutes or whether I had hours of hard labor ahead of me. I was going to be unlucky this time. It was a nasty presentation. Head back and no room at all. More like being inside an undeveloped heifer than a second caver. And she was bone dry. The waters must have gone away from her hours ago. She had been running out in the high fields and started to cab a week before her time. 
That's why they had brought her here into this half-ruined barn. Anyway, it would be a long time before I saw my bed again. Well now, what have you found, young man? Uncle's penetrating voice cut through the silence. Head back, eh? Well, you won't have much trouble then. I've seen Mr. Broomfield do him like that. He turns calf right around and brings it out, back legs first. I had heard this sort of nonsense before. A short time in the practice had taught me that all farmers were experts with other farmers' livestock. When their animals were in trouble, they tended to rush to the phone for the vet, but with their neighbors, they were confident, knowledgeable, and full of helpful advice. And another phenomenon I had observed was that their advice was usually regarded as more valuable than that of the vets. Like now, for instance, Uncle was obviously an accepted sage, and the Dinsdales listened with deference to everything he said. Another way with a job like this, continued Uncle, is to get a few strong chaps with ropes and pull the thing out, head back and all. I gasped as I felt my way around. I'm afraid it's impossible to turn a calf completely around in this small space, and to pull it out without bringing the head round would certainly break the mother's pelvis. The Dinsdales narrowed their eyes. Clearly, they thought I was hedging in the face of Uncle's superior knowledge. And now, two hours later, defeat was just around the corner. I was just about whacked. I had rolled and groveled on the filthy cobbles while the Dinsdales watched me in morose silence, and Uncle kept up a non-stop stream of comment. Uncle, his ruddy face glowing with delight, his little eyes sparkling, hadn't had such a happy night for years. His long trek up the hillside had been repaid a hundredfold. His vitality was undiminished. He had enjoyed every minute. As I lay there, eyes closed, face stiff with dirt, mouth hanging open, Uncle took his pipe in his hand and leaned forward on the straw bale. You're about beat, young man, he said with a deep satisfaction. Well, I've never seen Mr. Broomfield beat, but he has a lot of experience, and what's more, he's strong, really strong. That's one man you couldn't tire. Rage flooded through me like a draught of a strong spirit. The right thing to do, of course, would be get up, tip the bucket of bloody water over uncle's head, run down the hill, and drive away. Away from Yorkshire, away from uncle, away from the Dinsdales, and away from this cow. Instead, I clenched my teeth, braced my legs, and pushed with everything I had, and with a sensation of disbelief, I felt my noose slide over the sharp little incisor teeth and into the calf's mouth. Gingerly, muttering a prayer, I pulled on the thin rope with my left hand and felt the slip knot tighten. I had a hold of that lower jaw. At last I could start doing something. Now hold this rope, Mr. Dinsdale, and just keep a gentle tension on it. I'm going to repel the calf, and if you pull steadily at the same time, the head ought to come round. What if the rope comes off? asked Uncle, hopefully. I didn't answer. I put my hand against the calf's shoulder and began to push against the cow's contractions. I felt the small body moving away from me. Now a steady pull, Mr. Dinsdale, without jerking. And to myself, oh God, please don't let this slip off. The head was coming round. I could feel the neck straightening against my arm, and then the ear touched my elbow. I let go the shoulder and grabbed the little muzzle, keeping the teeth away from the vaginal wall of my hand. I guided the head until it was resting where it should be, on the forelimbs. Quickly I extended the noose until it reached behind the ears. Now pull on the head as she strains. Nay, you should pull on the legs now, cried the uncle. Pull on the bloody head rope, I tell you. I bellowed at the top of my voice and felt immediately better as Uncle retired, offended, 
to his bail. With traction, the head was brought out and the rest of the body followed easily. The little animal lay motionless on the cobbles, eyes glassy and unseeing, tongue blue and grossly swollen. It'll be dead, bound to be dead, grunted uncle, returning to the attack. I cleared the mucus from the mouth, blew hard down the throat and began artificial respiration. After a few pressures on the rim, the calf gave a grasp, a gasp, and the light eyelids flickered. Then it started to inhale. One leg jerked. Uncle took off his hat and scratched his head in disbelief. By God, it is alive. I'd have thought it'd sure be dead after you messed about all that time. A lot of fire had gone out of him and his pipe hung down empty from his lips. I know what this little fellow wants, I, got, I said. I grasped the calf by its forelegs and pulled it up to its mother's head. The cow was stretched out on her side, her head extended wearily along the rough floor. Her ribs heaved, her eyes were almost closed. She looked past caring about anything. And then she felt the calf's body against her face, and there was a transformation. Her eyes opened wide and her muzzle began a snuffling exploration of the new object. Her interest grew with every sniff and she struggled onto her chest, nosing and probing all over the calf, rumbling deep in her chest. Then she began to lick him methodically. Nature provides the perfect stimulant massage for a time like this and the little creature arched his back as the coarse papillae on the tongue dragged along his skin. Within a minute, he was shaking his head and trying to sit up. I grinned. This was the bit that I liked, that little miracle. I felt it was something that would never grow stale no matter how often I saw it. I cleaned as much of the dried blood and filth from my body as I could, but most of it had caked onto my skin and not even my fingernails would move it. It would have to wait for the hot bath at home. Pulling my shirt over my head, I felt as though I had been beaten for a long time with a thick stick. Every muscle ached. My mouth was dried out, my lips almost sticking together. A long, sad figure hovered near. How about a drink? asked Mr. Dinsdale. I could feel my grimy face crackling into an incredulous smile. A vision of hot tea well laced with whiskey swam before me. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Dinsdale. I'd love a drink. It has been a hard two hours. Nay, said Mr. Dinsdale, looking at me steadily. I meant for the cow. I began to babble. Oh, oh yes, of course, certainly. By all means, give her a drink. She must be very thirsty. It'll do her good. Certainly, certainly, yes, do give her a drink. I gathered up my tackle and stumbled out of the barn. On the moor it was still dark and a bitter wind whipped over the snow, stinging my eyes. As I plodded down the slope, Uncle's voice, strident and undefeated, reached me for the last time. Mr. Broomfield doesn't believe in giving a drink after Cavan. Says it chills the stomach. End of chapter one, all creatures great and small.